is my talk, Fashion and Anxiety in Tang China. I put my email down at the bottom in case questions occur to you later, not today, and you want to ask me. And um, I'm going to talk about four different things that provoke anxiety related to fashion in, in Tang China. And I'm just going to give you a little teaser right now before I get into them. So the first thing is, what if the emperor wears the wrong clothes? And that's the emperor wearing some fancy clothes. And then the second thing is, what if court women wear the wrong clothes? This is a nice little sculpture of a um, court lady from your collection here. What about foreign influence on Chinese clothing? That was a huge worry during the Tang Dynasty. And this is a foreigner on, a, on his horse with very exaggerated features, also a sculpture from your collection. And what if women started wearing foreign fashion? And not only that, but what if they started wearing foreign men's clothes? So these are the four things I'm going to be looking at today in more detail. So here's the outline. First, sort of a, a little premise, like, why do I think I can even do this kind of thing? And then uh, I'm going to say a little bit about the Tang Dynasty. I'm sure you already know about the Tang Dynasty, but just a little bit about that. And then um, talk about my sources. And the main source I'm using is what's called the Treatise on Vehicles and Clothing um, from the uh, Tang Official Histories. And so I'll talk about that one. That's the main thing I'm going to be using. But there's a whole bunch of other sources that are kind of supplementary to that. So then I'll talk about the treatise, in particular about what kind of values it shows and how is it organized, and then the conflicts I just mentioned that cause anxiety. In the first case, the case of the emperor's clothes, I'm going to give you um, a case, sort of case history from the treatise of a problem that comes up and actually gets solved. And then the, the next three things are basically just harangues from the treatise about, you know, women wearing the wrong clothes, foreign clothes, women wearing foreign clothes. And then, um, of course, all along, I want to try to compare it to the material record so you can sort of see what, is the, what does art and archaeology and remains of material culture show us about these same things. So the premise, my premise is that cultural systems in any society and for example, systems of clothing like I'm talking about today, reveal the beliefs and values of the people in that society and also show what feels natural or comfortable to them. And those of you who know the work of the great anthropologist Clifford Geertz, um, particularly his article on Balinese cockfighting in which he sort of derives a whole religious system or talks about religion as a cultural system, you can see that I'm just, you know, stealing this from him, only he's, he uses it to talk about religion and I'm using it to talk about visual systems of clothing. Okay, so the Tang Dynasty. So um, I've been studying the Tang Dynasty for a really long time and when I would, um, <clears throat> excuse me, when I went to China, um, out, you know, people, everybody, taxi drivers, fellow students would say, what do you study, you know, what's a foreigner here doing, you know, what are you studying here? And I would say, oh, I study the Tang Dynasty. And everybody, you know, from the people who worked in the hotels to the scholars to the officials, everybody would say, ah, the Tang. Like China really rocked during the Tang Dynasty. You know, it was like, then they, everybody knows that, the golden age is the golden age. They learn that in school. Um, so in, in, just to kind of briefly characterize it, in, in the Tang Dynasty, the capital city was Chang'an, probably the biggest city in the world at that time, with over a million people inside the city walls. City lay down on a grid, really organized. Um, that's modern Xi'an. The, the ruling family was called the Li family. They were on the throne for, for a really long time. And for the most part, the country was very wealthy, very well-governed, very organized. Um, the government uh, wealth and organization was based on a very efficient census which allowed them to tax the people and make the money to build the palaces and make the government work. So um, taxes, corvée labor also based on the census, that's the labor that people owed the government, you know, a certain amount of time every year. And then the military draft. So the efficient census allowed all these things to happen, which then allowed them to fight their wars and take over territory, et cetera, et cetera. The military was super powerful, especially the first half of the dynasty, and completely dependent on the horse. They had, you know, they had great weapons, but what really mattered was the horse. And the horse they'd gotten from peoples of Central Asia, they also had learned horsemanship from the peoples of Central Asia. 
during the Tang, they had their own stud farms out in Central Asia, out in the Silk Road. And um, after the middle of the Tang, I'll get to that in a second, when they lost that territory, they lost the stud farms and they lost access to good horses and the military just sort of declined after that. Um, the territory was enormous, probably the biggest it ever has been until now. And in fact, a lot of the territorial claims that the Chinese government makes today are based on Tang, um, you know, asser assertions of power in various places. Oh, okay, what else? Oh yeah, the era of the Silk Road. So this is the time of the Silk Road, this great international culture that spread all across, you know, um, Central Asia and China and also went to Japan and Korea. Um, time of a very cosmo cosmopolitan culture, tons of foreign influences in China that were very celebrated during the first half of the dynasty. After that, maybe not so much. Also a period of great innovations in all the sciences. You know, we think mainly medicine, astronomy, but really everything. And um, technology and also in the crafts, especially metal craft and weaving. Just a lot of sort of uh, sharing skills and craftsmen back and forth between the West and East. In the middle of this period, we have the major trauma of the Tang Dynasty, which was a rebellion called the Anlushan Rebellion, named after a foreign general uh, serving the Chinese who led a rebellion against the Chinese government. And the rebellion was put down, but so much damage was done. And after that rebellion, 756 to 763, after that period, nothing was ever the same again. They never got the census back in order. So taxes, corvée labor, and the draft couldn't, couldn't catch up. They lost the stud farms for horses in Central Asia. Just, you know, they just never quite got it back. And that affects the psychology of some of the things I'll be talking about today. And then um, all of these issues or all these sort of characteristics of the Tang are reflected in material culture and especially in clothes, or that's my argument. So now I want to just show you a few pieces related to the Tang that are from the collection here. So this is just to remind us of how important the horse was. The horse was like the engine of war and the engine of the conquest of all these places out in the Silk Road. They didn't exactly conquer the whole Silk Road, but what they did was patrol the, the corridors of trade and power so that they could you know, make, make uh, exchanges possible. And another piece from your collection, this wonderful camel with a foreign groom. This was what allowed goods to be traded back and forth along the Silk Road. And um, just notice the foreign groom with his foreign clothing. That not just the, the camels came from um, parts west of China, but the expertise for dealing with them did too. And then this is a wonderful little silver cup, also in the collection here, that um, the, the metal uh, techniques that are used here, such as hammering and incising and so forth, came to China from the West. This is a huge period of development of metal technology. And if you look in the central panel, let's see if I can make this thing go, like right here, there's a hunting scene which also comes into China from Persia. The Sasanian dynasty is just collapsing at the beginning of the Tang. And lots of their, the, the last prince who was supposed to become the last, would have become the last king, came on a mission to the Tang capital, bringing tons of craftsmen at the very beginning of the Tang. So there's this huge exchange. And then while he was gone, um, his father got conquered and killed. And so he stayed in the Tang capital. Anyway, um, whoops, got ahead of myself. Okay, so another foreign influence, these roundels, these round shapes that turn up in all kinds of different art forms. They turn up in metal, they turn up in ceramics. This is a bowl, or sorry, a plate from your collection that just shows this roundel form. Sometimes they have flowers in the middle, and then this one has a goose flying in the middle, and they have all kinds of stuff in the middle of these roundels. You can get like griffins, tigers, bulls, boars, and it also turns up in um, textile art. Here's one with a couple of griffins in the middle of it. And this one is actually is Sasanian. This is not from your collection. This is just something I got off the internet. Um, but it comes from Persia. The roundels come from Persia to China. And then here's another Sasanian one, this one with ducks in the middle. And now, okay, this is Zhou Fang's uh, famous painting attributed to Zhou Fang. And I don't know if you can see it very well, but there's roundels all over this silk garment and this one too. 
So we'll come back to that one when we talk about court ladies. Okay, so sources. So the main one is the first one and the last one. The treatise on vehicles and clothing. I put the Chinese characters up there for those of you who like to know what that is. So the treatise on vehicles and clothing in the old tongue history, um, it's the main one I'm using because it's the only one I've translated completely yet. <laughs> It's really long, it's like 120 big sections long. So I'm gonna, I mean, there's one in the New Tongue History as well, but I haven't translated that one yet. So that's my sort of long-term project right now. And then um, the other things I'm using is a book called Illustrations to the Ritual Classics, which is from around the same time. It's basically a book of pictures of everything you need to do all the important Chinese rituals. So pictures, and includes pictures of clothes, as well as vessels and altars and all kinds of other stuff and treatise on the five elements from the new tongue history. Five elements treatises are usually about omens. So it'll be somebody, in, in the case of clothing omens, it'll be somebody was wearing this and that was really lucky or that was really unlucky. So reading these kind of meanings into it. And then uh, moving on down, uh, essential documents of the tongue is just what it sounds like, sort of an encyclopedia of government documents. The Tang Law Code of 653 actually started in the 620s, but kept getting amended until then, and it's the first complete law code we have from China. Um, we have lots of fragments before that. But it addresses foreigners. And then a little bit of, one little quote from Confucius, from the Tang poet um, Han Yu, and then omen lore, um, we'll, we'll see when we get to that what it is. And then poetry, just some, some poems talk about clothing, and then the all-important archaeological record. So the treatise on vehicles and clothing, I want to just take a minute and talk to you about what this text is and what kind of, what, you know, what it meant to the people who, who wrote it. So vehicles and clothing are basically visual symbols of power and status and wealth. And when I was first working on this thing, about 10 years ago when I first started, I was walking with my son on the beach in La Jolla, he was home from school, and I was saying, you know, I really want to do this thing, and I'm kind of interested in it, but I don't really know why they put vehicles and clothing together in the same treatise. And he just sort of stopped in his tracks on the beach, and he turned around and looked at me like I was the stupidest person he'd ever seen, and he said, Mom, it's cars and fashion. It's like status symbols, yeah. It's like, okay, well, yes. So anyway, the point is that these um, vehicles and clothing reflect and also make visible to others the user's identity and the user's place in the social system and social hierarchies. And so if you, know the, if you know the system, you can look at people and instantly place them. You instantly know where they belong, what their status is. And you know, anyway, so that's, that's um, the system. So the clothing and vehicles are both subject to government relation, sorry, regulations, which are like sumptuary laws. Um, and like sumptuary laws, the fact that they need to have them shows that there's got to be some conflict and some slippage and some people that are wearing stuff they're not supposed to have. Um, okay, like sumptuary laws. So the regulations express the state concern with legitimacy and power. They regulate these things because they, you know, they want to control them. They want to control access to goods who can drive what, who can wear what, and they want to control the system of signs, that is, they want to be the ones defining things. The treatise is um, a prescriptive text, that is, it tells us what should be, not necessarily what is, and presenting this ideal world of human and cosmic order and harmony um, seen through clothes. So it's like the closer expression of ideal cosmic order and harmony. And the text um, is prescribing through description. Like it'll say, okay, the emperor wears this, and then it'll list every single thing that the emperor wears on a certain occasion. And then it'll say, you know, official of the fifth rank wears this, and it'll list everything. So it's sort of saying, it's saying it as though that's what's happening, but it's, it's sort of telling us what should be happening more than what necessarily is happening. So the idea is that the right clothes, everybody wearing the right clothes, that's a good omen, and that means that the mandate of heaven is safe and the, the emperor is safe on his throne. Um, at the same time, it, it identifies potential threats to order, and that's what I want to talk about today a little bit later. Um, so breaking classical precedents is one of the big threats to order. 
appropriation of high status clothing by lower status people is another big threat to order and copying foreign styles becomes a threat to order. It moves from being a huge fad in the beginning of the dynasty to being a threat by the end of the dynasty. And as I said, if you know the code, you can instantly identify anybody that you see. You can place them in order. And so I just want to show you a couple of officials. Um, this guy, you can probably see his hat has a bird on it up there. Um, hats are really important, but the bird would identify him as what rank and what, what you know, whether the, the top part of that rank or the bottom part of that rank, which unfortunately I forgot to bring my notes with me so I don't remember which rank this guy is, so I can't sound all smart about that. Um, and then here's another official. So if, if we knew the system, and we, and we would look at the hat first, you look at the top first and then you go down. We, if we knew the system, we'd be able to rank these guys. These are two um, figures from your collection here. So the values of the treatise. Um, first, one of the most important values is hierarchies, establishing hierarchies. And, and hierarchies um, relate to your social class, relate to your age, and relate to your gender. So all these things would be what we would look at in just establishing somebody's place in the hierarchies. And hierarchies were considered to be good, natural, and orderly. I can't tell you how many times I've had you know, students say to me, but you know, Professor Cahill, it's, you know, what about equality? Not a thing. Equality was never, ever a value in early China. Um, order was the most important thing. So order was important, and order would be order in the family, order in society, and cosmic order. And they're all linked to one another. They're all related. And ritual is the expression of order. And um, yeah, as I said, everything is linked. They're all linked together, and what I would argue is that these, these uh, ideas of hierarchy and order are made visual in the systems of clothing. And just to um, emphasize the cosmic importance of clothing, that clothing, you know, wearing the right thing actually has something to do with cosmic order. So the treatise assumes, as I said before, that social and cosmic hierarchies are natural, good, and orderly, and that order in the state correlates with cosmic order. So there, those things are related. So control of symbols and ranks, that correlates to order in the state, or the, the, that's a sign that the state, in fact, is orderly. And state order means, or indicates, that the government has possession of the mandate of heaven and so is safe and will continue, has the support of heaven. So disruption in the symbols is a sign, sort of an early warning sign, of disruption of the mandate. So the wrong clothing, is um, disruption of the symbol system. And uh, you know, if you do that, if you wear the wrong clothing, a cascade effect will start happening and pretty soon you're gonna end up with a loss of the mandate, universal chaos. So we think you know, something as simple as, oh, you wear, the, you, know, you wear the wrong style of dress to a party. It's, you know, it's, it's much more serious here than a social, um, you know, social mistake. It's like, it really indicates you know, serious things wrong in the government and in the universe. So let me just say a little bit about the organization of the treatise. How is it organized? And this is one of the longest treatises in the Tang history. So, you know, they obviously thought it was something important. So clothing is listed in social order. We start with the emperor and we end with, you know, in the men, we start with the emperor, we end with the little guys who, who um, take care of the water clocks in the palace. Um, and then the women are after that. Women are at the end. <laughs> of course, women are down. Um, so men before women, old before young, etc. And then within the individual entries on each level, we have different levels of ensemble. So we start with, um, with uh, the most formal occasions, and then we move down to the least formal occasions when you're just lounging around your house. Let's see. And so then within each entry, like say the... Is this thing getting strange or is this okay? Okay, good. Let me know if it does. Within each entry, we also have sort of, they're also relentlessly hierarchically. So the outfits start with a, with a hat at the top and then you just go down bit by bit. You know, the, what do you have on the top? What do you have around your waist? What do you have hanging from your waist? What do you have on the bottom? And what is your, what, what's your footwear like? So you go from you know, head to toe, heaven to earth, 
um, and so forth, most honored to the least honored. And then each ensemble is named after the headwear, which it took me like the longest time to figure this out. You know, it would be called the so-and-so hat. And I'm like, what do you mean the so-and-so hat? We're talking about, you know, skirts and belts and all this stuff, but that's just how you name it. You name it after the hat. Um, okay, and also uh, function, okay. So now I'm gonna get finally to the anxieties and conflicts. So number one, anxiety. Emperor wearing the wrong clothes. That's the worst possible thing. And I'm gonna talk about a case where the emperor might be wearing the wrong clothes and then it actually gets argued out in the treatise and then they actually come to a solution, which is not that common. <laughs> and then the next are the harangues, women appropriating higher status clothes than they're entitled to. Chinese people wearing foreign clothes, and I put the term that they use in there just for those of you who like that. And then Chinese women wearing foreign clothes, which seems to be a category all its own and, you know, has a special case of badness. Okay, so here's the conflict and resolution, and I want to tell you about what the conflict about the emperor's clothes um, was, and then the way that they argued it at court, and then the solution that they came to. And I'll show you some pictures of the clothes. So this is, um, the treatise records a, m a memorial that a whole bunch of really important court officials submitted to the emperor in 656, and it copies the whole memorial into the, into the treatise, and it's about, uh, it's the Emperor Gao Song, and they're saying, would you please abolish the great fur headwear ensemble, and that's the term, and would you please replace it with the full formal headwear ensemble? Sorry about these cumbersome translations. Um, so, it's a very long discussion, which suggests how, you know, just how seriously they took this, how important it was to them. So, and in the treatise, they also describe both of these outfits, and I took just little tiny uh, sections from that translation to just, um, to, to read to you here. Um, the, the great fur headwear ensemble, the first one, says the headwear had no fringes, the accompanying robe was made of black lambskin. And then they go on and on and on, and then at the end they say the emperor wore this ensemble when sacrificing to the deities of heaven and the spirits of the earth. That's the most important sacrifice of the year. So the old, you know, this text and old text before said, this is what he wears for the most important sacrifices. Okay, so then the one they want to replace it with says from, um, from the headwear hung tw 12 strands of white beads, which probably are pearls. He wore the black upper garments and the dark red lower garments together bearing the 12 insignia. Those are all those symbols, you know, dragons and suns and constellations and so forth. And then further down in the description, he wore this when he performed various offerings and sacrifices, including those at the ancestral temple, when he sent off supreme commanders, when he returned from battle, when he ascended the throne that is took it for the first time, when he married or received the court on New Year's Day. So those are all very important events. So, you know, everything here is, is, is a major thing. The, the ones for the um, great fur headwear may be even more important, but both very important. Okay, so now this is from that book I told you about at the beginning when I was talking about sources called the pictures of the stuff that's in the three ritual classics. This is the great fur headwear. So when I show this to my husband who doesn't read Chinese, he said, that's not fur. <laughs> so it's like by the time they're illustrating it, they already sort of don't very much want to illustrate fur. But since it's called the great fur head, head, um, headwear ensemble, I think we can assume that they do mean it to be fur. And maybe that texturing on his back is sort of a gesture to that. Uh, okay, and then here's the other one, looking like the picture that was a screensaver in the beginning with the not 12 if you count them, but the pearl things hanging down, and with the symbols, the dragons and various things on the, on the robe. So that's the, what they wanted to replace it with. Okay, so what's the problem with abolishing the great fur headwear ensemble? Well, there's a lot of problems with it. For one thing, it appears in the ancient ritual classics. So it's mentioned over and over again in the, in the um, books that describe the rites from the time of Confucius and a little bit later. And it's first in the list of imperial outfits in the treatise. So it's number one in the treatise itself. 
Um, the, the, the other one, the full formal headwear, is the second one. And the treatise list, which I'm not going to bother you with a lot about this, but that list in the treatise comes from an older thing when the Tang was first founded, where um, you know the, a bunch of officials submitted to the throne, okay, here's the clothes you should wear for rituals and various other things, your majesty. So they made this big old list of, of kind of regulations about clothing, and then they tinkered with it and tinkered with it, and it finally got formalized, and it ends up in the treatise. So that list was given to the founding emperor. He ordered it, and, and they made it up and gave it to him. So it has all the status that would cling to the memory of the founding emperor. And it was taken as authoritative throughout the tongue. So these officials criticizing the great fur headwear ensemble is, is um, pretty much they're criticizing the ritual classics. They're criticizing the regulations on garments, and they're criticizing the founding emperor. So they must have had some pretty good reasons to do that. Um, and it's a very daring thing to do. So they're really, really cautious as they construct their argument about why the emperor should do this thing that looks a little intemperate at first. So the authors of the memorial, and also, also later, the authors of the treatise, when they're kind of editing this memorial, you know, we, we can't assume that they, they're not putting in a little bit of their own slant into it. Anyway, they use multiple strategies to argue the issue and to settle the conflict and to help the emperor decide, because basically it's the emperor's decision. They're going to tell him all this stuff and then he's going to make up his mind. So the argument in this memorial, first they cite the ritual classics, because that's what you have to do in making an argument. You have to say, you have to quote all the early texts. They say this, they say this, they say this. So they do that. And they find that the ritual classics, although they're authoritative and you know, used in argument all over the place, in fact, they're quite inconsistent with each other. So they're going to kind of use that to get a little wiggle room, a little bit, it's going to become a little bit slippery so they can select what they want. They, you know, they sort of cherry pick the ancient texts. Um, then they also bring up practical concerns. For example, wearing a great fur huge robe in Chang'an or Xi'an in summer for the great summer sacrifices would be fairly miserable. Um, and precedent, so they make all these unfounded, in some cases, claims that the earlier emperors did exactly what they're arguing Gaozong, the emperor, should do. And then they claim that they're following the classics, which in many cases they're not at all. They're, they're misquoting the classics, they're using them irrelevantly. And then they criticize, you know, then just in case they didn't have enough, they criticize some of the classics which they've been revering up to that point as being outmoded. So it's sort of like every single all over the, all over the ballpark kind of argument. And then there's another subtext in the treatise that I'll get to later when I'm talking about foreign stuff, which is that fur is ugly, foreign, and ill-omened. So that's not true at the time when the, when the emperor is making his decision about which robe to use, but it's true by the time this case got written up. Um, okay. So anyway, I'm not going to go into all this stuff about the ritual classics, except to tell you that these, these three texts, actually there are two texts, the second two references are both chapters of the record of the rites, but the first one, the, rec the, the, the rituals of the Zhou, talk about the emperor wearing the great fur headwear ensemble um, when he's sacrificing to the, to the um, ruler of the heavens, the most important sacrifice, and wearing the other one, when he, the second one, when he sacrifices to his own ancestors, former rulers. So in that case, the great fur ensemble would be more important. And then the record of the rites talks about the emperor wearing the full formal headwear ensemble to, um, at very important sacrifices also to symbolize uh, the heavens and putting on the headwear with 12 suspended you know, pearl strings because 12 was the number of heaven. And then the last one, totally irrelevant, um, says during the first, mo uh, first month of winter, the son of heaven begins to wear fur. It's nothing about that outfit, it's just fur. So it's like, well, fine, but so what? But anyway, they, you know, they're quoting classics, so they gotta bring it in. Um, okay, so, what are we going to do about the ways in which these classics seem to contradict each other? The ritual classics don't agree with each other, that, that's clear. So here's what they say. The two ritual texts in discussing the suburban sacrifice both mention these two different ensembles, but they have differences. 
So that's, that's the great conclusion these guys are coming to about the differences. And so what they're going to do is they're just going to pick whatever they want. They say, well, they have differences, so we can't rely on these, so we can just do what we want. And then they say the great fur ensemble is unsuitable to sacrifice in all seasons, as I just mentioned, you know, be miserable in the summer. Um, they list the imperial precedents. They list a lot of emperors and what they wore in various sacrifices without any particular... Um, evidence to back them up, and they're basically claiming that all the important earlier emperors that we still revere today all wore the garment that we're suggesting your majesty wear. Uh, and then they ignore any inconsistencies. So after this long thing in which they've been quoting inconsistent um, uh, references in the classics, they say, so the comprehensive compendia of a hundred rulers had no inconsistencies with what's recorded in the ritual classics. So it's like sort of head-scratchingly illogical, but anyway, they're saying there's no inconsistencies, and so everything is just fine. And then they say, parts of the Jolie are obsolete. This is actually one of my favorite little parts in the sections here. Wearing the great fur ensemble, great fur headdress ensemble would be like the practices of the Joe officials responsible for overturning birds' nests, expelling frogs, and exterminating crickets. In other words, things that we no longer have officials doing today, things that are obsolete. So what happens? So Emperor Gaozong ordered the two outfits made. It's like so simple, so practical. He just had both outfits made, and he tried them on, and he didn't like the big fur one. So he just decided that the great fur ensemble, headwear ensemble, was too rough and simple, and so he quit using it. So it's like all that all that, all that, and then he finally like, just, okay, so just make the garments, we'll see, and then he, he uh, that's his solution. Okay, and here is a later version, this is by Ma Lin, the great um, Southern Song painter, he did a, a series of a bunch of emperors, this is you the great, and you can see the, the, um, the pearls, not 12, but who's counting, and the sun, the constellations, dragons, the things that are listed as the symbols that go on the, on the gown of the Son of Heaven. And this is the standard most, the, 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 the highest, for the highest sacrifices, the gown he wears. Okay, let's see. So my next cases are not anywhere near as long as that and don't have anywhere near as neat a resolution, but just want to bring up some more anxieties. And the next one is women wearing inappropriate clo clothing. This is something that is complained about a lot, and especially women wearing things that are too luxurious or appropriating things from women of higher classes. And then also women wearing immodest clothing, wearing clothing that is not virtuous, let's say. So here's some nice modest clothing, some pieces from your, um, or a piece from your collection, probably a servant lady at court or in, in a temple holding an incense burner. And this is probably a dancer, so she may be um, a tongue dancer. She may not be wearing the most modest of clothing, um, although there certainly is a lot of it. And she may be wearing you know, a lot of fancy stuff, but she's a dancer, so she, you know, she's not a court lady. She's not governed by the same regulations. So then there's an imperial decree which does not specify exactly what the emperor hates in the lady's clothing, but I'm quoting it here just to show you that this was something the emperor felt was important enough that he could sort of, um, you know, harangue people at court about. So he says, inner court ladies in some cases when they entered the forbidden, that is the palace gates, their dress failed to show respect and reverence. This behavior is a perversion and ceremonial deportment. To conform with proper principles, it must be forbidden and abolished. So people have been complaining about, especially like uh, low-cut dresses that the ladies were wearing and people, women riding without veils over their heads, etc. And he was like, this is really threatening our social order, that women are wearing these you know, immodest clothing. We have to stop it. And then here's a, um, a good example of excess. So this is from... Uh, it's right at the end of a section that's talking about what court ladies can actually wear and it lists like what color you wear according to your rank and how many hairpins you can have in your hair, what you can hang from your belt at your waist, etc. 
So women's banquet clothes, which would be probably second level of formality, not the most important ritual clothing, but what you would wear at court banquets, so you'd be in, in the court being pretty formal. Banquets clothes follow their husbands in the colors they may wear, and women of lower ranks may not appropriate the colors of those of higher ranks, but when they're not at court, their customs can become extravagant and excessive, not following the rules and orders, and they wear, and then there's this big long list of these really luxurious fabrics which are very difficult to produce. Some of them get incorrectly translated things like brocade now, but also there's a very fine netted silk gauze, but just basically a list of really expensive, very time consuming to produce fabric. So I just wrote luxurious fabrics. They wear them just as they please. And from the palace above, so the people at court, to the ignorant multitude below, the people out in the streets of Chang'an, they all rush to imitate one another so that noble and base lose their distinction. So there's that threat to the hierarchy appearing again, noble and base losing their distinction. And also the fashion itself is seen as a threat. You know, women all imitating each other and going through fashion cycles and so on, that that's sort of seen as something that can threaten the order and threaten the hierarchy. Okay, and then I'm bringing back the Zhou Fang um, painting to show you these are exactly the kind of fabrics that, that the treatise is talking about. These you know, thick brocades here and here, and the fine sheer netted gauze silk um, and even the servant girl is dressed in very expensive fabrics. And also just notice, uh, for when we get to later, the eyebrows are makeup, a foreign, foreign sort of fashion makeup, and then all these hairpins. So the hairpins uh, would have been regulated how many you can have. And of course, when we get, well, let's see if I've got a hairpin here. Oh, anyway, okay, so this is just another close-up of, of the ladies with their hairpins and their makeup and their servants. And there are layers and layers and yards and yards of this, you know, super expensive fabric. Not an austerity picture. Okay, so hairpins. This is one from your collection. Of course, we can't tell from the context, um, you know, we can't tell from it being in a, in a collection in a museum whether any particular lady was wearing too many or too few, but this is just to show you what the hairpins looked like. They're pretty elaborate, and a lot of the metalworking techniques are things that come into China from um, Central Asia, from Persia. So there's one. And then here's another one from your collection. They also had ones that had little things dangling down that were called step shakers in Chinese. If you walk along, they kind of tinkle and shake when you move. Uh, okay, so now, ladies riding immodestly dressed. This is another shocker. During the early Tang, when palace ladies rode horseback, they followed the old regulations and wore a long veiled hat, really long veiled, like, almost like a burqa. Um, served as a veil to conceal the whole body as they didn't want bystanders to stare at them. Then later they wore a curtain hat, kind of like a beekeeper's hat, um, that only extended to the neck, gradually becoming more vulgar and exposed. They rushed to imitate each other, so there's that fashion thing again, until indecent headwear gradually became customary. During the mid tongue palace prohibitions regulations, we could say, became more loose. Palace ladies wore foreign hats. I'll get to the foreign later. Exposing their exquisitely made up faces. Soon they started showing their chignons as they galloped around. And some even wore men's clothing and boots and tops. It got to the point where honored and base, inner and outer, had no distinction in their attire. So once again, threat to the hierarchy. And then here's one of those um, short curtain hats that's not as modest as the long veil that would cover the whole body, but this is a Tang uh, funerary sculpture from your collection showing the sort of intermediate stage. And then this one um, shows the final stage when they're exposing their chignons and their, their little buns upon their heads, really shocking, indecent, naked head naked head ladies, and this one's not, you know, not only is she doing all that, but she's playing polo, she's a polo player. They had women's polo teams in the, in the capital city of Chang'an. Polo was another import from the West. Anyway, indecent hair. Okay, so let's see, I can get through most of this, I think. So then the, the third problem I wanna talk about, and you can see with, with the, the um, 
women wearing excessive fashion, unlike the emperor wearing the wrong clothes, there really isn't a solution. There's just a lot of series of complaints about how this is threatening the social order. Same thing with Chinese wearing foreign clothes. So from, the, from one of the sources I mentioned at the beginning, the treatise on the five elements, there is the record that at the beginning of this era of 742 to 756, which ends with the An Lushan Rebellion, so that's no accident that they're talking about barbarian clothes on the eve of the, the sort of chaos-making event in the middle. Both nobles and commoners love to wear foreign clothing and foreign hats, so foreign stuff sort of stealing into the heart of the capital and corrupting things of their heart and so on, leading perhaps to to the An Lushan Rebellion. So um, enormous ambivalence towards foreigners, uh, especially in the late Tang. So in the beginning of the Tang, um, foreign fads were huge. I mean, it's just like everybody's wearing foreign clothes and playing foreign musical instruments and eating foreign foods and sitting on what they called barbarian stools, just everything all over the place, foreign music. And the royal family of the Tang, um, they were very proud to tell you in the beginning of the Tang, were partly foreign, probably Turkish in origin. So that's like all over the place in the early Tang. The royal princes used to sleep out in, in sky blue tents in the, on the grounds of the palace and all this other stuff. After the An Lushan Rebellion, they start sort of covering up their Turkish or other foreign or, origins. So after this An Lushan Rebellion that I mentioned as sort of the trauma or calamity in the middle of the Tang, foreign, um, foreign ideas and people come to be seen as a threat to cultural identity, a threat to, um, the threat of, sorry, cosmic and social disorder, a sign of personal decadence. If I'm wearing foreign clothes, it must mean that I'm, you know, not a very reliable or virtuous person and a danger to the dynastic mandate and to the people, to the actual subjects of the emperor. And from the, I was telling you uh, when I listed the sources in the beginning about a sort of compendium of Tang official documents that we still have. And it has this long list of people, um, sort of fads of people wearing foreign clothing. And then it says, as for those wearing foreign clothing, if they want to seek the blessings of the gods, this will be difficult. In other words, whenever they go into any kind of ritual con contact with their ancestors or the deities of heaven and earth, all those rituals won't work because they're wearing foreign clothes. So it's a really serious, this, you know, if you can't participate in the ritual, you're, you're pretty much out of luck. Uh, okay. So the treatise also has a little thing about foreign fads, the treatise on vehicles and clothing, and he says, the Chamberlain for ceremonial music, the guy who's in charge over the music that gets played at court, esteemed foreign tunes, and nobles presiding over fancy feasts exclusively provided foreign foods, and elite women all wore only foreign dress. For that reason, we had the rebellions of Fanyang, and Fanyang was the, uh, the command that An Lushan was in charge of as a, as a general. And so that's, so that's a reference to An Lushan Rebellion. He came from there. So that's, yeah, that's the An Lushan Rebellion. These were ill-omened events that came from loving and esteeming the distant. The distant. So loving foreign foods, wearing foreign clothes, etc., leads in their minds here directly to the An Lushan Rebellion collapse of order and near complete loss of the mandate, after which nothing was ever the same. Okay, so back to foreign, um, foreign people, esteemed, not esteemed. Um, this is a foreign uh, rider on a horse, and we know that the Chinese got a lot of their horsemanship and uh, skills and skills in training horses, riding horses, equipment for horses from these foreigners. But at the same time, you can see this man's features are kind of exaggerated, almost a caricature, and we're really meant to notice how different he looks from Han Chinese. And the clothing is different too, very suitable for riding on a horse. Um, speaking of caricatures, and these are all pieces in your collection, the, uh, the little guy, the little merchant holding the big wine skin, you know, sort of pot-bellied merchant with a pot-bellied um, sack of wine and a big nose and uh, pretty much a, a comic figure of a foreigner. 
But then, and well, this one we could say, and these are all from your collection, that we could say this is comic, but also it's kind of admiring. This is a dancer. A lot of female dancers, not so many male dancers in the pictures, but the dances, came, uh, a lot of the dances came into China from Central Asia. But again, exaggerated features. And then this is a foreigner um, wearing Chinese military official clothing. And there were lots of foreigners that were Chinese military officials because of their um, prowess and, and talent and, and et cetera, et cetera. But An Lushan was one of those foreign military officials. So foreign, um, foreign fashions and foreigners were both desired and feared. I'll give you a, a, a positive example. One of the one of my favorite poets, Li Shangyin, who's sort of known for his well, his sort of weird and perverse poetry. But he has, also has a diary, and in the diary, it, there's things that are impossible. He has lists. His list of all kinds of stuff. You know, th things I don't like. Things that are impossible. Um, so under the list of things that are impossible, one of the first items is a poor Persian. So the Chinese had this idea that Persians were all fabulously wealthy and had jewels and so forth. And then there's all these wonderful poems and paintings and figurines of dancers. We saw one of a Chinese dancer earlier, but there's lots of examples you could find of really beautiful um, descriptions and, and paintings of, of dancers. Then there's negative ones. Some of the figurines we just saw, they're like caricatures. There was a drinking game really popular in the Tang where you'd have this little sort of figure of a, of a foreigner and you'd put it on the on the tip of your cup, and everybody tried to make the foreigner fall into the cup, and you know, it was sort of called drunken foreigner game, and whoever uh, knocked somebody else's foreigner into their cup, um, the person whose cup the foreigner fell into had to drink. So it was basically a game of trying to get your opponents drunk. Uh, and then border poetry, a whole category of wonderful poetry in the Tang. They just basically laments how horrible is the destiny and fate of any Chinese person who has to go to the borders for whatever reason. Just like miserable, uncivilized, violent, etc. Tang law code uh, is really strict on foreigners. Uh, and um, so here's the articles, but um, they basically regulates interactions between Chinese and foreigners, and, and the punishments are very severe, and we have to assume that in most cases these punishments didn't really take place, or were, were rare, except, except in, um, in times of great control. So trade was really regulated, and I mean, that was effective until the second half of the tongue. So, you know, how, how do you... How do you trade? What do you trade? Where do you trade? Who do you get to trade it with? How do you, um, what kind of profits can you make? Military security, of course, very highly regulated. Intermarriage was forbidden. We know, um, you know, from any modern Chinese people taking DNA tests that that was obviously completely ignored, <laughs> especially people living on the border. I mean, you know, even if they know who's, who's originally what. And then illegal border crossings by foreign villains, another thing that probably happened a lot. But, you know, if they followed the, uh, the letter of the law, the, the punishments are very, very severe. So then I want to get to clothing and cultural identity, which is kind of what I've really been talking about all along. A quote from Confucius, um, maybe, you know, this is the stuff his students collected about him after he died. So he, uh, of various degrees of reliability. But anyway, there's a quote from his main, the main text we associate with Confucius called The Analects in English. And he says, were it not for Guan Gong, a figure who one of his students is criticizing, and Confucius is saying, wait a minute, if it wasn't for Guan Gong, we might all be wearing our hair loose and folding our clothes to the left. In other words, we might be wearing our hair down like foreigners, like undisciplined foreign barbarians, and we might be wearing our clothes fastened to the wrong side like undisciplined foreign barbarians. So already back there in the time of Confucius, there was this awareness of difference. And then one of my favorite rants of all times, Han Yu, known more for being a poet, well, a poet and a statesman. Um, he has this really famous memorial on the Buddhist finger bone. And the, the, the occasion for this is every year in the capital of Chang'an, there was this, uh, the most important, just backtrack a second, the most important Buddhist relic was uh, in, in China was at a temple about 120 kilometers out of Chang'an called the, anyway, temple, Buddhist temple. And once a year, they would um, parade, the, the court people would go out 
to the temple, and then they would parade the Buddha's finger bone into the capital. Huge festivities. Everybody got the day off. Lots of you know uh, preaching and so on, and um, lots of food being given out. You know, n not much productive labor going on. And then they'd march it back to the um, to the temple at the end of this time. So Han Yu thinks this is a huge waste, and he doesn't really like the Buddha very much anyway. So here's what he says. The Buddha was originally a tribesman from outlying regions, not Chinese. His language is incomprehensible to those who inhabit the heartland, and his clothes were of strange fashion. He did not speak the exemplary language of early kings, and he did not wear the exemplary garb of the early kings. So language and clothing here are the two most important cultural markers of being Chinese or not. And he's saying he wasn't Chinese. So this bone is a disgusting, loathsome object. He goes on to say that. And then another one of my favorites here, Clothing Omens. So this is from a much older book um, that says, uh, the, the name of the book is Records of Searching for the Supernatural. And during, the, during this era, 280 to 290, everybody took to wearing felt hats, felt turbans, felt belts, and felt cinchings for their leggings. Um, thereupon, people began teasing one another, saying China will soon be broken by barbarians. Now, felt is a product manufactured by barbarians, and if everybody began restricting his head, waist, and crotch with felt, then the barbarians were pressing on the Chinese on three vital sections. <laughs> Would this not soon lead to decline in the central kingdom? And in fact, this is the period right before a big conquest uh, of China by the northern barbarians, so-called northern barbarians. So it's like they're wearing foreign clothes, they're wearing it in their cent central centers of thinking and, um, and uh, you know, reproduction, all the important parts of their body, so not good. Then during the, tr uh, the treatise itself, the, the, the one I've been talking about most of the time, uh, in an earlier part before it, it starts describing Tang clothes. It says, during the later Wei and Northern Qi, which were pre-Tang non-Chinese dynasties, vehicles and clothing became strange and perverse. In other words, bad clothes in those times. When the foreigners were in charge, the clothes were bad. So I think, um, yeah, I think this is a good stopping point before the last section.